Good morning. Welcome back to our Monday morning oasis. You may be a bit uh, confused by the change in background. I am currently at a hotel in Indonesia. My family and I are on a short vacation before Christmas. Or we, we are on Christmas vacation, but we're on a short trip um, as we prepare for the feast of the Nativity of our Lord, the Incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I just woke up, so I'm a bit tired. I wanted to get, I wanted to stay consistent with the series because it's, it's been a great source of renewal and revelation for me. I hope it has been for you too. The Holy Spirit, the Paraclete, the Comforter, the Sanctifier, the One by whom Jesus Christ becomes present to us in manifold ways. This particular episode will be focused on how to distinguish between the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and the work of the devil, the flesh, and the world. Because a lot of the times we think we we're following the Holy Spirit when we may actually be deceived by Satan into following our own flesh. Um, so it's a very fine line that we're walking. You have to remember we are creatures and we have limits. We understand reality through our senses. And when our minds become corrupt, are corrupted by life experiences and past sins, even though we've been forgiven, even though we've done penance, the consequences of that sin on our habits, on our way of life, can have lasting consequences unless we learn to discern when the Holy Spirit's active. One thing must be absolutely clear is that the devil is able to deceive even the holiest of people. You have to remember he was the highest angel second only to God. And so he has a lot of power over human minds. But God has already revealed to us the, God, uh, the way out of deception. And it's actually quite simple. I offer you, well, I don't offer you, uh, Christ offers you the Beatitudes. Uh, it's important that you study the Beatitudes, read as much as you can on the Beatitudes, because those are the attitudes, the signposts by which we know whether we really belong to Christ, whether or not we really are animated by the Holy Spirit. Um, the uh, Beatitudes are quite profound, and there's not enough time to go into them now, but I will just cover one, uh, the first Beatitude, which is, Blessed are the poor in spirit. When you're poor in spirit, what it means is that you recognize that you're just a creature and you need help. It's recognizing that you need help from the Holy Spirit, that you depend on the Holy Spirit for your, your guidance and your very life and your salvation. Once you acknowledge that total and utter poverty, then you open yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit and you're able to see when it's the Holy Spirit guiding you, and when it's the demon. The, the devil is no fool. He knows how to trip you up. Beginning, people who are just starting the spiritual life, it's easier to get them with the obvious things, like, oh, why don't you go have some pizza instead of praying? After all, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to enjoy life, or or if they're struggling with any particular sin, why don't you just go do it? You can't do it. You can't make it. You know, look how hard it is to be holy. <sighs> Truly holy people, saintly people, they always speak in very simple, direct terms. They don't over-intellectualize anything. They'll just try to tell you straight to your face, look, the devil wants to destroy you. You need to stop doing this. That's it. None of this psychobabble. 
And we really need that back in the church's teachings. And that's one thing I credit Pope Francis with, whatever the controversy surrounds his papacy. Um, he has made some really good homilies on how, and very simple homilies on how the devil tries to destroy you. He's been very open about his belief in the devil as a true person. All right, so, but for people who've been praying for a long time, who live relatively good lives, how does he get those people? How does he get the ones who are actually practicing the faith? That's when it gets to be a bit more confusing because sometimes what he offers you is a good thing. You know, look at how he tried to tempt our Lord in the desert. You know, you're starving, you're fasting. Why don't you just have a little bread? Why don't you have a little water? Um, and there's nothing wrong with bread, nothing wrong with water, nothing wrong with eating. We're, we're creatures. You see, so that when there's, when there's that subtle hint at something that's actually good in and of itself, yet it will distract you from prayer, it will distract you from uh, the spiritual life in union with God and uh, charity towards others, then there's, there's got to be something wrong with it. So being poor in spirit is the first step to where you realize, hey, I need God, I need, I need His help. I can't just go on my own thoughts alone because if you go on your own thoughts, however well informed your brain is, how well, how, however well you know the faith, the devil will be able to, he knows the faith better than we do because he's, he's, de his, he's dedicated his entire life his eternity to destroying the faith. So he knows his enemy. But do we know our enemy? So that's why Christ sent the Holy Spirit because he knew that we can't, he knows we can't go it alone. He knows we need help. And it's when we start saying things like, well, I don't need this. I, I can just, I just, I just woke up. I can just go it alone. I can figure this out just by using logic. Well, logic is good when you're dealing with earthly things. But when it comes to spiritual things, logic can be used against you, right? Um, why do you spend so much time praying? You know, this whole time you could have been volunteering at a homeless shelter. Or why did you buy that spiritual book? that money that you spent could have gone to that homeless person. And you see, those are good things, volunteering at a homeless shelter. Christ said we're supposed to help the poor. No problem there. But um, when it interferes with our number one purpose, which is holiness of life, and holiness of life bears fruit in good actions like volunteering, but without that attention to the interior life, which the Holy Spirit calls us to, there's always a risk of falling back into sin. So how do we, excuse me, how do we recognize when is, when the Holy Spirit's at work? By the Beatitudes, study them closely. And the commandments, the Ten Commandments, look at them and just commit yourself to them without questioning. I think I mentioned it a few times already that this is where a lot of us give up because we think, oh, it's just too old-fashioned. It's too old-fashioned to give yourself to these old commandments. You know, the post-millennial mind needs to expand and learn, learn modern thinking. And modern thinking really isn't anything unusual. Modern thinking is just a repetition of the old sins and calls itself materialism or is labeled materialism. So we must always meditate on the commandments of God. The Psalms are always saying things like, your commandments are my delight. Are God's commandments your delight? Do you look at the commandment um, do not commit adultery and actually enjoy following this commandment. Because if it's a burden for you, if it makes you 
want to sin even more, then we need to keep praying. We need to keep mortifying ourselves so that we can see that true peace, true joy can be found in humble obedience, you know. I once read a book by this author who traveled to three different monasteries. One was a Hindu community he visited. One was a Buddhist. One was a Christian, a Benedictine, and Orthodox. And it was a very biased book. I was hoping that when I read it that it would say something, you know, nice and objective. But basically all he said about the Benedictine monastery is that they only worry about obedience, obedience, obedience as if obedience is some outdated, um, unhealthy way to think. But he said nothing but good things about the, uh, you know, the Hindu um, sadhus or holy people who don't seem to have any of these old-fashioned rules, and then everybody's just self-guided. Everyone is so nice and so friendly. They don't ask you where you come from or what you want. Um, so... The way this author presented everything was that, you know, this whole individualized Eastern way of thinking is the right way and humble obedience to God's commandments is the wrong way. And that really had an impact on me. It affected me many ways before I realized how biased he was. Obedience is difficult. Obedience takes great heroism to, to do. You know, just ask any... Uh, special forces soldier or any uh, professor or anybody who's really advanced in whatever their vocation is, they'll all say it takes discipline, it takes mortification, you know, and they may not use that word, but it takes sacrifice and obedience. So we must obey God's commandments. We must know them and just follow them. The catechism, especially the latest catechism from the 90s, 90s, I teach English, so sometimes I like to overpronounce things. The newest catechism is very good at uh, delineating the details of what it means to follow the commandments. It breaks down every commandment into all of its different life applications. So I highly recommend you read that, that, those articles in the new catechism about the commandments. So when we obey the commandments, when we follow the Beatitudes, um, the devil cannot have a hold on us. But you must take them all together. Don't isolate one, because then he'll use it against you. For example, um, the first commandment, uh, you shall not have any other gods before you. The devil is the kind of person who would say, um, Aren't you spending too much time praying? Aren't you just being too vain? Aren't you, um, why aren't you, why aren't you doing this, you know? Why aren't you doing that? Aren't you, you know, wasting time posting videos on YouTube that people don't really care about? I mean, you only have like seven views, ten views. Sometimes this happens when I'm posting videos. I look at the number of views and I get discouraged and I don't want to make any more videos. Sometimes I just want to end this channel. But I, whether or not I have a lot of views doesn't matter. I, this, video, this video, this YouTube channel for me is like a, a diary that, where I share my journey with other people and I hope that it helps other people on their journey. So isolating one particular commandment and not taking all the commandments together as absolute outside of yourself, exterior to your own thinking, then when you, when you take them as absolute, good things will happen. You know, for example, everybody likes to talk about the Sixth Commandment. Okay, let's talk about it. Adultery, uh, immorality, sexual immorality. When you commit yourself to that commandment, you won't need to commit any sexual immorality because you'll feel so refreshed your, your sexual desires will be renewed, baptized in a way. It's where you don't feel like you have to go out and do things that are wrong because you'll see sexuality in its true context, namely uh, committed conjugal love. Uh, 
and that will bring great joy to you. And if you choose not to follow a marriage vocation, you'll see it and you, you'll just have this reverence for the sexual function and you'll distance yourself from it. And people recognize holiness when they see it. Even people who aren't religious, they recognize something in a person that puts them above the rest. Not in a snobby sense, but in a way that makes them want to be with this person. I mean, if you're a woman watching this and you're at some club, you know, having a good time with your friends, and some guy starts talking to you, he's sleazy, you know, he's, he just, you could see in his eyes that he only wants one thing. You know, do you want to be with this kind of person? Or what if someone comes to you, he looks at you in the eyes and he sees you as a person? He just wants to know you as a person. Maybe he's lonely and wants to protect you. He may be open to a relationship with you, but what's most important is that you are a person in his life, whether as a friend or as a potential marriage uh, partner. Um, someone who really, who's really holy will attract other people to them because people feel safe. People feel safe. They feel healthy around truly holy people. Now, don't look at me because I'm not. I, I just, uh, I'm in this struggle just like everyone else. But I have noticed from experience that by humble obedience to the Sixth Commandment that my marriage has been very strong. My relationships with female co-workers is a healthy relationship. It's one where I can say, okay, this woman is very, very beautiful and she actually wants to be around me. She may not go to bed with me, but she wants to be around me. She wants to be a friend. She's a committed friend. And that healthy, holy relationship is actually far more, far more rewarding than just some fly-by-night escapade. You know, that could endanger you spiritually and endanger your family, you know. So holiness is cool. It really is. It really is. You know, I've met some uh, females who were chubby. They weren't exactly what we would call sexy. But because, they're, because of their faith in Christ, because of their holiness, there was something about them that made me really attracted to them. Maybe not sexually, but I wanted to be with them. I wanted to talk to them. So holiness always wins. And holiness doesn't mean uh, prudishness or snobbiness. Holiness is just that you, you, you decide to set yourself apart from the rat race. You set yourself apart from the whole culture of death. And when you do that, people will begin to notice you in a good way, mostly in a good way. You get some challengers, but that's, that's, part of the, that's part of the territory. So how do we recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit through obedience of the command? Does, it, does, does the impulse that come to you, does it conform to God's com objective commandments? You know, love God above all things, love neighbor as you love yourself. So be kind to yourself. All right, so in the next uh, episode on the Holy Spirit, we're going to talk a little bit more about how the devil tricks you. Uh, we need to deal with that. And then we'll get into the really good stuff, the, the, the prize for following the Holy Spirit. So pray for me. And uh, pray that I'm not deceived. Pray that the Holy Spirit enlighten me so I can use this channel as a way to help others for the greater glory of God.